closing bell coming up. We're pretty close to the highs in the S&P. Joining me, Lizanne Saunders and Kathy Jones to round out our discussion with the Schwab team for our big picture panel, of course, every day on MOC, but a special one with the ladies here in San Francisco together. Great to see you both. Thank you. Uh, let's talk some stocks, Lizanne. Of course, Kathy, Chief Fixed Income Strategist, and Lizanne, Chief Investment Strategist at Charles Schwab. Equities are looking pretty good, Lizanne. It is. It's interesting. It's a really good day for, for small caps. And you've had fits and starts of this uh, sort of move into small caps, which I think probably has legs. But I would, the one thing I'd cautious investors about is not to sacrifice quality. I think there are a lot of opportunities down the cap spectrum, but particularly in an index like the Russell 2000, which still has 43% of its members non profitable. Wow. I, I think you want to be careful of not sort of monolithically saying, let's get into small caps, but look for the, the better profitability, stronger balance sheet, higher interest coverage, better Did that number go up, unprofitable? Uh, it's been trending higher in That's, that index. To me, yeah. and it's why I often suggest to people not a recommendation to buy an index, but if you use indexes as a starting point for ideas, the S&P 600, S&P uses a profitability filter. So it's an inherently higher quality index. It's not used as much as a benchmark, but it's more of an FYI as opposed to, I'm saying go out and buy an S&P 600 fund. How much kind of if you take that uh, that quality factor filter uh, that you guys have been very bullish on, uh, which has performed well in a lot of different types of environments, what does it look like um, now kind of compared to maybe six months ago when like the tech stuff was really right. boring? Like NVIDIA's doing good today, but it's kind of the only one. The Mag 7's been pretty uh, kind of in the back seat now since the it, summer. Really since mid-July. Yeah, yeah it's, uh, it's gone through sort of multiple mini consolidation uh, phases. I think staying up in quality still makes sense, but I think what, may be, what we may be shifting from is sort of a, an environment around the level of quality, mm -hmm. sort of moment in time, strong balance sheet, to maybe now rate of change, where you, you look for opportunities, particularly if the Fed stays in easing mode, of improving balance sheet trends, improving interest coverage, so you kind of catch that pickup mm -hmm. as opposed to making a more level or moment in time based decision. Love that point. If some of the economic stuff comes to fruition, these companies can grow into some of the right. uh, things that might have been uh, reducing their you know, quality score. That's where we get to bonds, I think, Kathy. The most interesting thing in fixed income right now is maybe that coin flip for December instead of like 80 a week ago. Yeah, yeah it's down to almost 50-50 now. And I think some of the, the comments we've heard from Fed officials reinforce the idea that they're kind of open-minded on this one. They're yeah. probably 50-50 right now. You know, I think the case for a pause is pretty strong. Um, we've had very good economic data. The employment numbers after revisions look pretty good. Uh, financial conditions are very easy. There's no reason for them to, to be easing uh, on that basis. And it's kind of a wait and see. Let's look at the employment numbers. Let's look at the next set of inflation numbers, see if there's really a need to move quickly. And then, of course, finally, you have all the policy proposals that leave us all up in the air as to what next year and the year after will look like. We've got one more set of data points before December. So I guess we could have maybe one more bout of uh, swinginess in bonds before the end of the year. I am sure we'll have at least one more bout of volatility, if not a few more just, you know, for the yeah. fun of it, just because we're getting uh, a less liquid market as you go into the holidays and more uncertainty about what's happening next year. I've been uh, hearing a lot of muni bond pitches. Uh, and we were kind of talking about that through the lens of uh, maybe folks who were happy to get four, four and a half percent maybe a year ago. Um, where does that start to kick in, you think, where folks just say, oh, this is too juicy to refuse? Like, I imagine it's not where we are right now. No, I think the mob spread, the muni over bond spread is you know, it's kind of in the mid middle of its long-term average, maybe even at the lower end. So it's not likely, it's not at a point where valuations are so compelling that you have to jump in, but it's always, unis always work for high-income people. Uh, the last thought as we connect these, are curves been getting a little pinched? Is any of that gonna uh, bother stocks, Lizanne? So what we've been saying is that uh, I think longer-term yields are still someone in the driver's seat for the equity market, but I think it's the why behind yield moves that matters in terms of that correlation between bond yield moves and stock prices. When yields are moving tied to the growth outlook, you tend to be in a positive correlation mode where higher yields, better stock prices. If, if the connection is more to the inflation side of things, then I think you reestablish uh, an inverse correlation. So it's the why as much as the, the, the level. Today's why for jobs seemed pretty innocuous, pretty positive, right? Yeah, um, I, I think that 
the, the economic data continues to be mixed. And I do think the next labor market report and, of course, the inflation data is really going to be uh, key, especially for probabilities around what the Fed does. Love it. A great way to uh, finish our macro conversation ahead of the closing bell. Thanks a lot, Kathy Jones, Lizanne Saunders. Thanks.